Okay, so why don't we get started. Uh, so welcome back everyone uh, to our second day of workshops. Uh, and I'm very happy to uh, reintroduce Roman, uh, who's gonna be giving our workshop on introduction to Python. So Roman, I'm gonna let you go ahead and take it away. And we are recording this so that you have it available uh, as, a, as a review later on. Okay, fantastic. Uh, also, after the workshop, I'm going to post all the notes from this workshop for your access. And I'll give you guys a link a little bit closer to the end. Uh, so welcome again. This is going to be a very, very brief review of the most basic stuff that you can do in Python. It's aimed at people who have never used Python before. So if you have a little bit of experience, you might find this a bit boring, but we'll get to more advanced stuff later this week, hopefully. And I just wanted to make a few general uh, notes or statements, if you like, uh, about why we're doing this. Uh, this used to not be the case some hundred years ago or so, but it definitely is the case today that astronomy is a data-driven science. So if you take a picture of a galaxy, you don't just look at it and wonder how pretty it is. That picture is basically a spreadsheet if you zoom in real close, because every single pixel is a number. And in order to be able to handle this, uh, you just can't do it by hand. A single person with a calculator would take way too long. And so the only way of moving forward, and it has been the case for the last few decades, is by teaching a computer to handle those numbers for us. A computer is really good at doing basic arithmetic operations, but it doesn't know how to do astronomy, which is why we have to teach it. And in order to do that, we have to talk to the computer in a language that it understands, which would be a programming language. Uh, so uh, this is a, a general service that provides statistics over a a range of topics. And if we go and look at the most commonly used programming languages in the world today, then you might notice that Python is the fourth most common language. It's out here occupying 44%. And this is of last year, I think. <laughs> uh, but uh, the first three programming languages on this list are actually cheating because they're all almost exclusively used in web development. So if you remove all of that and you only focus on real development, which I am saying as a former commercial web developer myself, then Python is the most popular language by a very wide margin. So this is a very brief outline of the things that I'm hoping to cover today. So all the core topics are the topics that I am hoping will have enough time to talk about in a reasonable level of detail. Uh, and then if we have a little bit of time left at the end, I might talk about some of those further topics. And if I do not, I am going to post some uh, Jupyter notebooks for you guys to click through on your own. And later this week, other people, uh, including Adam, Christian, and Dino, will be talking about more advanced features, uh, such as all of those libraries here. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, so I guess the first question to ask is, what is Python to begin with? And this is a one sentence summary of what it is. It is a high level interpreted, weekly typed programming language. And we can break this down piece by piece. The programming language means that it's a language that we can describe instructions to a computer. This is what we want to do. We want to teach our computer to do astronomy for us. A high level means the level of instructions that you would have to be talking to the computer at. So an example is here in the middle of the screen, an algorithm for making T. And this is a medium level algorithm. You can get a mark, you can throw a T back, you can boil some water, you can wait for five minutes and then you get T out of it. But this is not how your brain sees this. The way your brain sees this is like that. It's just contractions and relaxations of individual muscles. So this is an example of a high level programming language. And this is an example of a very low level programming language. And then you can take it one step further and have a look at it from the other side. And like the highest level programming language will just have one instruction, just make T. So if we uh, draw this analogy back to our Python, then Python would be right in the middle here. Uh, and then this would be something like assembly, which nobody knows anymore. Uh, and this is something that Christian will be talking about later. This is machine learning. And we're not going to be doing that today either. Uh, so that's what it means to be a programming language, a high level programming language. So the next part of this sentence is that this is an interpreted programming language. And this is quite important. Uh, so the first thing I would like to try and demonstrate is just the most basic use case for Python. So I have this folder on my computer, and it currently has only one file. 
And this file is empty. So this is a text file that has nothing in it. I can open it in a text editor and it's completely blank. And what I would like to do now is just type some very, very basic Python code. And we'll get back to uh, what that means in a second. But this is going to be just one line of code. And all it does is just prints this statement, hello world, onto the screen. This is probably the most basic Python code you can have. I'm going to save this file. And then I am going to open my terminal. And if I just try typing the name of this file right away, it is not going to run. So if I just type script.py, the name of the text file, then the, the operating system is going to complain. This is because even though we are doing programming, we will not be making any actual programs, which is a little bit confusing. Instead, we will be using a different software package called the interpreter, which is going to look at our text file and it's going to translate that Python code into machine instructions and send them down into the CPU of our processor. The drawback of that is that you can't just give this file to somebody who doesn't have a Python interpreter installed. They would not be able to do anything with it because it is not a program. It cannot run on its own. So what I can do instead is I can call the interpreter and the alias of that interpreter is just Python. It's very simple. And I can ask the interpreter to run this file for me instead of asking the operating system directly. And hopefully, if I hit return now, it's just going to print hello world. So this is ultimately what that means for a programming language to be interpreted, which is the uh, second part of this statement. Now, in principle, you could run all your Python code like this. You could create a text file, you could put it in, and then you can open the terminal, and you can use the interpreter to get that code to run. But this is fairly inconvenient, which is why not many people do it this way. And instead, people tend to prefer to use special development environments, special software packages that will organize the code for you and run that interpreter for you when you need it to. And the one that we most commonly use in our lab, the development environment, is called the Jupyter Notebook. And I know that some of you tried installing it earlier today and others may already have it installed. And what I would like to do now is just very briefly show how that environment works. And then we'll jump into talking about the uh, actual programming language itself. So there are two ways, two straightforward ways of getting Jupyter Notebook that I will talk about today. You can either download it and install it on your own computer, or as you will see in a second, you can run it on a cloud service provided by Google. And we recommend trying to do both uh, because later this week, you will be using your best software package ever written called Splat, which probably will not run on the Google cloud service, although I don't think anybody actually tried. <laughs> Maybe Adam has. Uh, and for that, you will need the local copy. But for today, if you do not have it installed, then using the cloud copy is more convenient. And it has a number of other advantages, such as it will be using the resources of the cloud service rather than hanging your local computer. Uh, so in order to access that cloud resource that I just mentioned, I, I would just Google. Google. <laughs> uh, it's called Google Co-Laboratory or Google Co-Lab. Uh, and the first link that shows up is that. And now we can hit new notebook and it will create a something that we call a notebook which is the environment that we'll be working with and then we can type our code in here and this is one way of doing it and alternatively you can download this uh, software environment called anaconda again if you just google anaconda download chances are that's going to be the first link that shows up and i know that some of you have done this in the morning and you can download Anaconda individual edition, which is entirely free. It's going to automatically detect your operating system and install itself. And then after that, you will have the option of launching Jupyter Notebook on your own machine. So what I would like to make this workshop uh, is something that you can interact with. And so what I would like you guys to do is to either bring up your local installation of Jupyter if you already have one, or uh, open the Google Collaboratory service and perhaps log in with your Google email address if you have one. Uh, and that way you will be able to follow me and I will be taking pauses and short breaks so that you could catch up. Uh, so right now I will maybe give everybody 30 or 60 seconds to try and get some Jupyter environment running. So ultimately your screen should look similar to mine right now. And you might want to arrange the windows on your 
uh, desktop so that you can see both me and your Jupyter Notebook environment. I don't know if it's possible. If I have two computers, that might help. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to take a very short break, 30 seconds. And if you can't get it running, then please let me know in the chat and I'll be, I'll be looking at that. Yeah, one thing I would suggest is if you're having trouble, um, so if you go to the Zoom window, there's a reactions panel. If you've got either your Jupyter Notebook set up on your local machine, or you've figured out how to get Colab started, use the little green check mark, just so we know, you know how many folks are ready to go. And then if you don't, and you're, you're not quite sure what to do, use the red cross or the red X uh, symbol, stop sign. Um, and then maybe what I'll do is I'll open up a, um, a breakout room uh, so that we can kind of help you. Well, I guess we could probably do this as a group. That's probably fine. So, so far I've got two people says they're okay. <laughs> yeah. It's also probably okay to just watch uh, if that's what you prefer to do. Well, now is a good time to just at least try to get this up and running. Certainly, yeah, it's certainly yeah. better to try and interact. Uh, yeah. But yeah, if you're really, really stuck, then we can find another time to, to get you running. I'll make my check mark too. I can't I can't see any of these check marks. So Adam, you'll have to let me know. <laughs> you can't see it in the participants window? Uh, can I can't even bring it up when I'm sharing the screen. Oh, right. Okay. Really? Oh, I can. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see a bunch. There was a question in chat if we're going to use NumPy a lot. Yeah. We'll get to NumPy today. And going forward, we will be using a lot of it. It's probably uh, the most frequently used library that we're going to deal with. Uh, more chat messages. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we won't necessarily be doing image processing. We'll be doing spectral data processing, but the idea is the same. You have you got numbers lots and lots of multi-dimensional data compiled of billions of numbers. Okay, so I'm not seeing any stop signs. So presumably I can keep on going, right? Yeah, so uh, so uh, Ransa, Bridget, um, Carlos, Arturo, Daniela, Ibar, Gong, Juan, or Mariana, if you're having some trouble, just enter your question in the chat window and then maybe I can manage that while Roman's doing his, uh, his demonstration. Okay. All right, so before anything, let's just have a look at the interface that we're dealing with. So every notebook, and this is what we call a project in this environment, uh, we call it a notebook. So currently there's a notebook open here. It's made of individual cells. And right now there's only one cell on the screen. It is this box here. And you can create more with those two buttons. You can either create a code cell or you can create a text cell. So there are two different types of cells. Now the code cells are the ones where you can run Python code as the name would suggest. So we can try running the same command that I tried running before directly through the interpreter. So that would be print hello world. And in order to run the cell, you can either hit this play button with your mouse or more conveniently, you can hit uh, shift and return on your keyboard, which is what I'm going to do. And because this is running remotely, it's going to take a few seconds for it to actually run, but eventually it will. And now we have the output right here. It says, hello world, as we expect it, and you should be able to do that. Uh, so Adam, shall I be looking at the chat at all, or are you going to handle it entirely? No, I, we're, we're swapping roles. I'm the TA, you're the professor, so I'll keep okay. my eye on the chat. Sounds good. Uh, now, before we go into any of the more advanced code, I also wanted to make, I guess, a few notes about the text cells, which is the second type of cells that we have. So here's a text cell. Now it's not that obvious because it does not have a box around it. So you can double click it and then the box appears. And in this cell, you can have, as the name of the cell would suggest, any text that you like. So I can type some text here. And then if you hit shift return, just like we did with the code cell, 
uh, shift enter, it is going to say that text. And the idea behind it is that you can document your code as you go along. So it's a good idea to write what the code cell is doing in a text cell above it so that first of all, you could understand what you were doing a few months down the line, and also so that you could pass this notebook along to somebody else and they could understand what is happening here. Uh, the text cells can contain plain text as it does right now, so I'm editing it again. If you happen to know uh, the so-called markdown language, then you can also use that. So for example, if I put this in asterisks, then hopefully it is going to become italic. There we go. Uh, and on Google Colab, apparently, you also have buttons uh, in the toolbar that can do that for you. This cell also supports basic HTML, if you happen to know how that works. So that's quite convenient. And if you don't, then don't worry. It doesn't really matter. And most importantly, it also supports LaTeX. So if you need to type equations and you happen to be familiar with LaTeX, you can do that as well. And that's incredibly convenient. Now, I am not going to be creating text cells because I will be commenting on everything that I do, but that is what you should be doing because that is considered good coding practice. So now I'm going to uh, remove this. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the syntax is, is Markdown? Yes, Markdown is supported. Yeah. You can use right. Markdown. Thank you. Uh, and uh, you can look up Markdown Cheat Sheet, which is a really good summary. It's somewhere on GitHub if you're interested. I don't I'll, know. I'll, sorry, I'll just add in that you could also just add in the text uh, block there as well. Yeah, so plain text is also supported. Yeah. Okay, so now we can move back to our code cell and we can play a little bit more with actual Python, which is what we're all doing. So hopefully uh, you have successfully managed to run some code, whether it's this hello world statement or something else. And in order to understand how Python works, we need to understand data types. This is probably the most important concept in the core. So we'll start with a very simple example and I will work my way up and I will be taking short pauses so that you guys could catch up if you are trying to follow me. So the simplest example that I can think of, we can just type a number, for example, five, and then I can run this cell. And in this case, we are giving Python an item of data. Right, so an item of data could be a number, it could be a string of text, it could be a vector, it could be a matrix. In this case, it's just an integer. And we're not telling Python to do anything with it. Like the only thing that I typed is this number five. And if Python doesn't have anything to do with it, then the output is just going to be back what we gave it. Right, the, ultimate, the ultimate point of programming is converting input data into output data. And this is what we're doing. And in this case, input and output are the exact same thing. Now, if you have two different numbers, you can combine them with basic arithmetic operations. We can use Python as a calculator. So for example, if I type five plus two and I run this cell, then the answer that I'm going to get is seven. So in this case, we are providing some input. Those are those two items of data, five and two, and a basic arithmetic operation, a basic operator. And then the Python is going to complete that operation and display the output directly to us. In addition to addition, we also have all the other basic arithmetic operations. We have subtraction, which is just dash. We have multiplication. Uh, so what's quite interesting about Python, contrary to a lot of languages, if you want to raise five to a power, for example, if you want five squared, and instead of doing the caret character, which is what most languages do, you actually have to do double asterisk. And in this case, we're going to get 25. And what you might have noticed is that all the data that I am given Python, so those numbers five and two, I am typing them without the decimal point. Right? So I'm typing them as integers. I'm not typing them as, for example, 2.0. I'm doing it just the whole part and no fractional part. And Python is responding in the same way. So in Python, there's actually a big difference between an integer and a real number. And if I provide my data as real numbers, so instead of two and five, I say use 2.2 and 5.0, then the answer is also going to be a real number. So now Python is also using the decimal point. And there is a big difference in how those two different data types are stored. And there is a big difference in how they are handled and what operations are available. Uh, so for example, the operation of division, which we haven't seen before, which is indicated with just forward slash, it is actually not supported by integers. 
All right, so if we go back and we do five plus two the way we did it, then we give Python two integers and we get an integer back. But if we try and divide five by two, Python is going to give us a real number back. So the decimal point appears. So in the process, Python realized that it can't divide five and integer by two and integer and get an integer. And instead it converted the data type from an integer to a real number. So this is something that we call typecasting. Now, as it happens, there is another operation in Python called integer division. And it's denoted not with just one slash, but with two different slashes. And if you run that, then Python is going to force the answer to be an integer. It will not be allowed to do this conversion. And so the final output is going to be two. And so this is just a general example of how types are working. And we'll uh, look at a few more advanced examples in a second. Uh, so there is integers. There is real numbers. In Python, we call them floats. And there are other data types. For example, uh, another important data type that we'll be using a lot is a string of text. For example, hello world. And in order for Python to know that this is a string of text and not something else, we have to wrap it in quotation marks. I'm going to add a quotation mark in the beginning, a quotation mark at the end. And now if we run this code, Python is also going to respond with quotation marks because it understands that it's a string and it's returning back a string. And depending on the data type, the operations that are available and how they're going to work are going to be different. For example, if I have two plus two, then Python knows that those are integers and the answer is going to be four. However, if I turn those two data values from integers into strings by just throwing them in quotes, so now they are strings, then the answer is going to be very different. Because for strings, when you use this plus operator, it is actually not addition, but it's concatenation. And if you try and multiply a string by an integer, then it's going to duplicate this string three times. And so the answer is going to be two, 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 as opposed to if two were an integer, then we would, of course, get just six. And then some operations are simply impossible to do. For example, you cannot divide strings. So if I try and divide, I don't know, world by two, then the result of that is going to be an error. And Python will complain saying that this operator cannot be used on a, an item of data of the type string and an item of data of the type in integer, which is exactly what's going on here. So to give you guys another example, which I find quite interesting. So if we go back to the difference between integers and float numbers. So uh, a good example to consider is this one. I'm just going to type it out. Uh, and then maybe I would like somebody to predict what's going to happen. Uh, so when I run this command here, string and brackets, what I can do is I can explicitly ask Python to typecast something into a string. So for example, if I type 256 here, even though the original input is an integer, the output of this whole operation is going to be a string. I'm just telling Python, take this and convert it into a string. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, put a number on the inside of this. And this is how scientific notation works in Python. So this e means times 10 to the power of something. So 1 e 20 means 1 times 10 to the power of 20. And uh, the way scientific notation works is very similar to a decimal point. The moment it appears, Python knows that this is going to be a float, a real number, and not an integer. And then I'm going to take this very, very large number, and I'm going to add uh, say some very small number, for example, two, and I'm going to keep it an integer. And then I can type cast this whole thing into an integer. So here's what I'm telling Python to do. Take this big number, add this small number, uh, get the result, whatever it is, turn it into an integer, then turn it into a string, and then uh, output the result. So do we have any predictions as to what the, the output is going to be? I'm just going to uh, have a very quick look at the chat, or you can just run it. <laughs> It says error. Yes. Uh, let's see. No, uh, not in my case. Oh, no. I did something wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see my error. OK. So are we getting the same thing? And thanks for interacting. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, it's, it's working for me. OK. So what you might have noticed is that we have one with 20 zeros. That's that number. And then this number just disappeared entirely. 
So you know the difference between integers and floats, and these are just examples of how different data types are processed differently, is that integers are stored in memory exactly. So if I type an integer, whatever it can be, I can type an arbitrary number of digits, uh, not letters. Uh, Python is going to treat this integer as it is. It is not going to try and range it or approximate it in any way. This is exact. Now, on the other hand, float numbers, real numbers, can only have a maximum fixed number of significant figures. And if you exceed that number of significant figures, then Python will range it to a value that fits in the memory. And this is exactly what's happening here. This number is so small that it gets lost in rounding. So what we can do now, we can change things slightly. And instead of typecasting things into an integer after the fact, I can typecast this big number into an integer before I do the addition. So now instead of adding a float and an integer and then typecasting them into an integer, I'm adding an integer to an integer. And if I run this cell again, then as you can see, this two comes back. Uh, because integers are handled exactly. So the moment I run this bit of code, I'm telling Python that I want this number to be exact, do not range it. And then I can do integer arithmetic with this number and that number, and everything is preserved. And finally, I'm typecasting it into a string, which is why those quotes are here. OK. Do we have any questions about this? <laughs> are you able to reproduce this on your side? No question for the moment. Yeah. Okay. So before we move on, I would like to very briefly touch upon complex numbers. And we don't use complex numbers all that often, but they are a very good demonstration of how Python works. So, so far, we've considered three different types. We've seen strings, we've seen integers, and we've seen floats. The complex number is another type. So it's going to be the fourth data type that we're going to see. And in Python, in order to type a complex number, you just type the real and imaginary parts and you use J for the imaginary part. So in this case, this is going to be 1 plus 5i. Uh, in fact, in order to confirm that this is an imaginary number or a complex number, you can use this structure called type in Python. We'll talk about uh, those structures. They're called functions, actually, in a second. And what this does is it asks Python what the type of whatever that's in brackets is. So if I type type 1 plus 5j, it's going to tell us that the type is complex. Uh, if I replace it with just one, it's going to say it's an integer. If I replace it with 1.0, it's going to say it's a float. But for 1 plus 5j, this is a complex number. Uh, and Python is what we call an object-oriented language. And this is a very complicated topic that we're not going to go in much detail. In fact, I don't really understand it in much detail. But what that means is that every single item of data that we have, integer, complex number, whatever, it is allowed to have attributes. So if I remove this type, I don't want it anymore. Uh, so an attribute is a little bit like attributes in the real world. You can have a car, and that car can have a color. It can have a size. So in the same way, all of those objects of data have attributes as well. And if you are a complex number, then one of the attributes that you're going to have is called iMatch, which uh, is an attribute that tells you what the imaginary component of this number is. There is also an attribute called real, which gives you the real component of this number. So the way you handle attributes is by uh, typing in a period or a full stop after whatever the object that you want to know the attributes of are, and then typing out the name of the attribute. And those attributes are going to depend on the data type. So this attribute here called real, it is defined for complex numbers. It is not defined for, for example, integers. So if this data item were an integer instead, Python is going to, oh, that actually worked. Okay. Hmm. Okay, I guess it is defined for old. Okay, it's not going to be defined for a string. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, so a data type of type, sorry, a data item of type string does not have an attribute called I match, as you would expect, because a string does not have an imaginary and real components. And this is quite important. Okay, so we'll be dealing with libraries in a second, and basically all of those libraries are objects, and all we'll be doing is just using different attributes of those objects. Okay, so at this point, I would like to, uh, I guess, finish this discussion of data types, and we'll come back to them in a second. And I would like to have a look at some of the more complicated things that you can do with a language. Uh, specifically, so far, we've only considered operations that are literally one line of code. For example, two plus two. Now, 
this is what the calculator does, and that's great, but we want to do something more complicated than that, which means that we want multiple operations to be done in a sequence. And in order to do that, it will be helpful to be able to save intermediate results and then access them later. So for example, what I might want to do is I want to take this 2 plus 2 as the expression, and I want to give it a name so that then I could refer to it later. And the structure in any language that does that is called a variable. And in order to define a variable, you need to come up with a name for a variable, for example, A. Uh, names of variables have to be letters or digits or underscores, but they cannot start with a digit. So A is one letter. You can have multiple later letters, A, 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 whatever. Uh, typically, you want variables to have meaningful names because it helps us to read your code. But for now, let's just stick to A. And then I can type this expression that I was dealing with 2 plus 2 in the first place. And now what I'm telling Python is that I want this expression to be stored in memory. And I want to give it a name. I'm going to call it A, or I could call it whatever, George. You can come up with any name that you like. And later, I would like to be able to access that. And this equal sign here is not actually an equality. It's what we call an assignment operator. What that means is take the expression on the right and store it under the name that's to the left of the assignment operator. So if we run this code, nothing is going to be printed out. However, this variable now exists, and I can access the result of this expression by typing the name of my variable back. And this variable is going to remain defined until you either redefine it and you define it as something else. For example, if I, I don't know, set it to 6, and it's going to change or until you terminate the session of your notebook or until you restart the kernel. And the way you do that is by going into runtime and hitting restart. So if I restart this, uh, then this variable is going to lose its definition and an attempt to print it is going to result in an error that says that it's undefined. So I have to redefine it again. And this is quite important is when we're working with Jupyter notebooks, we tend to forget that those variables persist. And sometimes you write code that relies on some leftover stuff that you saved in variables whose definitions you erased a long time ago. And the code is running right now because all those variables are still in the memory of your computer. But then you restart your Jupyter notebook session or give that code to somebody else. And it's no longer going to run because those variables are gone. So it is very important that when you're testing your code that you frequently restart the code all the way we did it just now. And you make sure that your code is self-reliant and it is not depending on anything that is currently stored in the variables, if that makes sense. Okay, so let's try and take this to a slightly higher level. So let's create multiple variables. Let's create a variable called A and set it to two. And now we can use multiple lines of code. Uh, let's create a variable called b and set that to 6 and c and set that to, for example, the sum of a and b, or maybe even something more complicated. We could do a times b plus c. And you can use uh, parentheses to determine the order of operations. Normally, Python would be doing the regular order, so multiplication and division, then subtraction and addition. But you can use parentheses to rewrite that. So what's happening now is we're defining a variable called a, we're giving it a value, same with b, and then we're using those variables to create a new variable that was meant to be a, sorry. Uh, and so can somebody give me a, well, I guess it's too simple. <laughs> All right, so if we just type c out, uh, then we would be getting the result of this expression here. And this is pretty much what we do, right? We just process data, we push it into a variable, and then we move on to the next step, and we just keep on going until we get our final output. OK, do we have any questions about this for now? So I just wanted to give a slightly more interesting example no. of this. OK. Sorry, I think Adriana has a question. Okay. Yes, I have a question. I, I already write the instructions that you have on the screen. OK. I click on the row, but doesn't display it doesn't print anything so should i put something? yeah so this cell is not going to print anything uh but if you then ask python for the value of c the way i'm doing it right now then it will give it to you oh i see, I see. yeah so those are two different separate cells uh, so this is quite interesting uh 
So by default, and this is just a quirk of the Jupyter Notebook environment, okay. it will typically print out the output of the very last line. However, the very last line is an assignment operator, and it does not have an output. Assignment operators do not return an output, which is why it's not printing anything here. Thank you. OK. Uh, so it's slightly more interesting example. Suppose that we have those two variables, a and b, and a is 2 and b is 6. And what I would like to do is I would like to swap them around. And this is an example that if you've never heard of assignment operator and how variables work, then maybe it will make things a little bit clearer, at least it did for me when I was learning this for the first time. Suppose that I want to swap those two values. So I want a to be equal to 6, and I want b to be equal to 2. So the, the intuitive way of doing it, the way I did it the first time, is just set A to B and then set B to A. Uh, how simple can that be? So I'm just saying, okay, whatever is in B, make that A. Whatever is in A, make that B. But if you run that code and then you actually look at what you have, so we can uh, use the print statement, which is just going to display those variables, comma separated then the value is going to be 6 and 6 instead of what we expect. So we wanted A to be 6 and B to be 2. And what's happening here is that the moment we ran this first line of code here, A equals B, the original value of A got permanently lost. So this value of 2 is no longer assigned to any variable. Now we have B that is still 6 and A that was set to B, so it's also 6. And Perhaps the only general way of solving this problem is by introducing a third variable and temporarily storing the original value of A in it. So what I could do is I could introduce a third variable and we should be given variables meaningful names. I'm just going to call it the original A and I can store it into, uh, and I can store the value of A in there. And I need to do this before I lose it. So this is too late. I have to do this before this first line of code. And now, instead of assigning B to A, I would assign B to the original value of A. So if I rerun this cell to reset them back to what they were, and then I run my swapping algorithm, and then I print both values, then hopefully we're going to get 6 and 2. All right, so this is pretty much as complicated as assignment can get. OK, uh, so moving on from variables, the next important structure in the language that we need to talk about is functions. Uh, and we are speeding up a little bit. Uh, so do let me know if you need a short break. I'm going to delete those cells. All right, so you, we will be doing the same things over and over again. For example, you might want to solve a quadratic equation. And you might run some code or write some code and then run it that does that. But then in the future, you might need to solve another quadratic equation or maybe another one after that. And you would not want to duplicate the same code over and over again. So just like we had a value and we stored it in a variable and we gave it a name, what we would like to do now is we'd like to take a bit of code and give that whole thing a name and then be able to just call that code without retyping it whenever we want. And this is the basic premise behind functions. And uh, the, uh, the way things work are different in different programming languages. In Fortran, there is a distinction between subroutines and uh, functions. In Python, none of that exists. Uh, so it's going to be really, really easy. So let's come up with some code. Uh, we, we can circle back to solving quadratic equations, but let's start with something really simple. So let's write some code that takes some variable x and let's set that variable to something like 8. And it computes the square root of that variable. And let's say that it saves it in a different variable called result. And the way to do it is by using the uh, double asterisk, which is the power. And then we can raise this x to the power of 0.5. And if we run this and then we print our result, it's going to be the square root of 8. That looks about right. And in order to make those two lines a function, what we would do is we would use the def statement, which is uh, a keyword that you would use every time that you want to create a function. Then we need to pick a name for our function. And the rules are the same as with the names of variables. In fact, in Python, functions are a special type of a variable. So let's call it something meaningful, for example, square root. And then after that, you're going to need a pair of parentheses. And inside those parentheses, you need to list all the input, all the arguments that this function is going to need, which in our case is just one. It's the number that we're trying to calculate the square root of. 
and I already called it X, so I'm going to stick it in there. And finally, the statement adds, ends with a column. And now all the code that you want to be inside this function, in the body of that function is what we call it, you need to uh, add a whole bunch of spaces in front of every line. So you add some indentation. The convention is to use four spaces. And in fact, if you use the uh, the tab key, then the environment is going to do it. In fact, for some strange reason, Google Colab is using two spaces instead of four. So it doesn't really matter as long as the number of spaces is the same. So now we're telling Python that those two lines of code, because they have the same indentation, they all belong to the body of this function. And finally, at the end, we need to use the so-called return statement, which serves two purposes. First of all, it tells Python that this is where the function ends. This is where this function terminates. And also, it allows you to specify what the output of that function is, which in this case is going to be a result. So this is our function. And now if we run this cell, this function is now stored in the memory. And now we can call that function. So if I type square root again, uh, and then in parentheses, I need to provide some input for that function, for example, 8, then it's going to calculate the square root for us. And now we can do this an indefinite number of times. And we don't have to retype the same code. I can now calculate the square root of 64. And hopefully, that's going to be OK. So here, I'm force setting it to some number that should not be happening. OK. So we want that x to be whatever the, the input is. And as you can see, this is incredibly convenient. And this is generally how we write all of the code. So all of the operations are typically wrapped into individual functions. And then all that the main code of the program is doing is dispatching those functions whenever it is necessary. OK, do we have any questions about this? Or shall we have a look at a slightly more complicated function? Yes. How many spaces do we have to leave uh, after that uh, colon? Any number the... as long as, oh, sorry, out here? Yeah, after the colon, like uh, before the result. Oh, sorry. Any number that you like, as long as you are being consistent. I could add two more, and that's not going to change. Okay. Yeah, so typically the environment is helping you. So when I hit the tab key, it's going to insert a certain number of spaces just to help you out. And for some reason, it's two here, even though the official Python style guide says it's supposed to be four. So whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Any number of spaces is going to work. So something that is uh, quite interesting about Python, which isn't a feature that is present in uh, too many programming languages, is that your function can have multiple outputs. It can also have multiple inputs. That's quite common, but it can also have multiple outputs. So just to give you uh, a slightly more example of a function, let's go back to the original example that I had in mind, and let's write a function that solves a quadratic equation. Uh, so let's give it some meaningful name, for example, solve quadratic and uh, you can have more than one input. And if you're solving a quadratic equation, so the form is going to be, right, I can use LaTeX, which is going to be a plus x, uh, ax squared plus px plus c equals zero. OK, so that's what we want to do. Uh, and we want to find x. So that's going to be the output. But the inputs are going to be a, b, and c. Uh, it's a very good idea when you're writing a function to make the first line of that function the so-called doc string. And the way you do it is you type three double quotes. And then you just explain what that function is doing. Ax squared plus b x. Let me just have a multiplication sign here. Plus c equals 0. Uh, and the reason why we're doing this is because if you do this, then the environment is going to create documentation automatically, and it's going to know what that function is doing, and it will display it as a suggestion if you use autocomplete, which I might show you guys how to do. But it's just generally a good coding practice to add a doc string. It is not going to run, uh, but it helps us see what the function is doing. And now we can implement the actual code of the function. Uh, so now I'm just going to use arithmetic operations, nothing too complicated about it. Uh, we can calculate the determinant of this, which uh, fortunately I have notes. Otherwise, I would never be able to remember this with a gun to my head, uh, not since high school. But I think it's b squared time, minus 4 times a times c. 
Uh, and now something that's quite important, if we want our function to also produce imaginary routes whenever they are available, uh, we won't be able to do this because currently everything is real or everything might be real depending on the input. So it's a good idea to just uh, force Python to convert everything into complex numbers. All right, so there is this typecasting function called complex and all it's going to do is just typecast whatever the value of D was into complex and save it back into the same variable. So now we have a complex determinant and then the first root is going to be minus B plus the square root of the determinant which we can actually use the square root function that we uh, defined above. You can call functions within functions. All right, so the square root of the determinant and we want to divide all of that by two times B. And the second root is going to be, I'm just going to copy that, X2, the exact same thing, but with a minus instead of a plus. Uh, so hopefully this is correct. And then we can return multiple values again. We just comma separate them. So it's still the return uh, statement followed by X1, X2. And we can run this cell and we can save this function. And now after the body of this function, so we don't need the indentation anymore, we don't need the spaces, we can call this function solve quad, and we need to provide those three uh, arguments that we defined. So we need to provide A, B, and C. And in the simplest case, it could be something like one, one, and zero. And then the output of this is going to be, the first root is going to be zero, and the second root is going to be minus one. And the imaginary component is zero. So this equation has real solutions. We could also try and force imaginary solutions if we do something like one, zero, two. Uh, and you might notice that even though those solutions are purely imaginary, the real part is not exactly equal to zero. As remember that float point arithmetic does not work with numbers exactly. It does some rounding. And in this case, even though the answer, the true answer is supposed to be zero, there is some machine error in the 17th decimal place. Not a big deal for any practical application, but it's interesting to see that it is happening. If we dealt with integers, this would not be happening because integers are handled exactly. OK. So this is an example of how you can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Uh, and you can have significantly more complicated function structures in Python. And this is one of the further topics that I outlined in the beginning. So if we get to that, then we might talk about it in a uh, few minutes. And if we can't get to that, then I will post a Jupyter notebook that talks about things like optional arguments, default values for arguments, and the like. OK. I have a question, Shuma. Sure. Uh, on the legend of source quadratic equation, I noticed that there are three um, apostrophes. I don't know how to say it. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Double quote. That is the um, a comment. That's the that's the way how to put the comment. So technically, uh, this actually makes it a string. Uh, so it's really, really weird. It's just a convention, right? So this is just a random string that's not doing anything and it's just floating here. Uh, but, yeah. So if you have a string that's the first line of the body of the function, it's interpreted as doc string. And then the official Python style guidelines are telling you that you're supposed to be using triple double quotes. <laughs> oh, okay. So Roman? I follow the instruction then. Yeah. Uh, so Roman, yeah, to, actually Carlos has a comment that a comment is usually <laughs> has a a little number sign at the front of the line. But maybe you can demonstrate why this is useful by doing solve the underscore quad dot help or question yeah. marks all that. That's right. So what we can do in the Jupyter environment is we can type the name of our function. And then when we open the parentheses, it actually displays our doc string out here, which is quite useful. Uh, in the offline version, I think you have to use shift tabulation. And as Adam mentioned, there is a built-in function called help. And that retrieves documentation for any uh, function, any variable. So if you give the name of your function to this function, then it's also going to display the doc string. So this is really, you know, particularly as you're starting to build more complex code, this is really useful for putting these, uh, we call them help strings or doc strings in. So you kind of know which each of these functions are doing. Um, you know, I find if I come back to my code like three months later, I have no idea why I wrote that function unless I put some, you know, doc strings in and then I can very easily see the help file for that. 
Yeah. Can you say again what instruction created? Uh, so, so I, I call it a doc string. There's different ways of sort of terminologies for these things, but basically this is, you're describing the purpose of this function with that triple quoted uh, oh, line there. All right, yeah. all right, thank you. And something else that's important that Adam mentioned in passing, and I should have mentioned, I forgot about it, is that, yeah, comments. <laughs> uh, if you use the number sign anywhere, uh, it turns green. And then after this number sign, you can type anything you like, anything I like. And the interpreter is going to ignore this entirely. So this is what we call a comment. And it is there just for you to make comments. So for example, this is a good way of explaining the purpose of a particular line that's slightly unobvious. And in general, this is something that you should be doing. I'm not doing it right now because I am commenting verbally on everything that I'm doing. But if you are writing things down, then this is a this is a good thing to do. So you have three different tools for annotation and documentation. You have doc strings, you have uh, text cells, and you have inline comments with a number sign. And all of those are important. Okay, uh, so maybe in a couple of minutes we could take a short break because we've been doing this for almost uh, an hour now. But before we do that, just very very briefly, I mentioned that. Functions are also a special type of a variable in Python. In fact, we can use this function called type in order to see the type of this function. And it's just going to tell us that it's a function. Just like for number five, it's going to tell that it's an integer. Uh, and this is quite interesting because you can do a lot of things with it. For example, you can do assignment. And so we have this function called solve quote, and I could assign it to some other variable, for example, uh, u. And I could assign that to my solve code. And then I can use u to evaluate that function. So if I do one, zero, and two, then it starts acting just like the original function was. And you might notice that when I was running this assignment, I did not have parentheses. And so parentheses, if you put them after the name of the function, then the function will be called. And if you do not do that, then the function is just being handled as an object that can be assigned and passed on to other variables. In fact, you can have functions that take functions as their arguments. And this is something that people do uh, quite often. So if I added parentheses here and I threw the inputs in here, so for example, the same ones, 102, then u is not going to become a function. Instead, this function will get called and its output will be stored in u. Uh, so if I run this, then u is no longer a function, u is just the result. So if I try running u as a function, then Python is going to tell me that it's not callable. You can't call that. However, if I just uh, print u as it is, then that's just going to be the result of that. Yeah, so this is the difference between having a function with a pair of parentheses, in which case it's evaluated, it's called, and without, in which case it's handled as a thing, right? It's a function, like an integer or a string. Okay. So it's 13.55. Shall we take a five minute break, Adam? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Okay. And if you have any questions, do let me know. Okay, so we'll start back up again at two o'clock. Okay, sounds good. Currently have in this notebook. And Roman, we, oh, okay. You're deleting everything, but at some point we should leave a notebook that they can play with. Uh, I have notes with okay. the snippets and I'm going to post them. Great. Okay. Yeah. I do not have a notebook. I have a PDF file with all of that. Okay. Uh, so, so far. Good question. We, yeah. Is there, is there a way to clear everything like without deleting everything individually? No, oh, that's a good question. I don't think it's something that people want to do particularly often. You can create a new notebook. I don't even know if there's a way of selecting multiple cells at the same time. It's not going to work. Oh, yeah. OK. I guess you can do control select. Yeah. I never tried that. I never needed to delete everything before. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, that's a good question. Uh, also, it might be different between different versions of Jupyter Notebook, uh, as this uh, cloud version is a bit different to the local version that you may have. Okay, 
Uh, so, so far we've only considered linear flow. So for example, the algorithm was uh, get a mug, throw a tea bag, uh, and boil water. But what if you have no tea bags? In that case, you presumably want to introduce some conditions into your algorithm. Like if there is a tea bag, then throw it in a mug. And if there isn't, then run off to the store and get some. And as you can imagine, virtually every program that's not trivial is going to have some kind of nonlinear flow. And in Python, this is implemented through conditional statements. And this is what I would like to talk about right now. Uh, and we can start with a very simple example. Let's have a variable, let's call it a, let's assign an integer to it, for example, five. And now I'm going to type a condition. Uh, it's going to be a very simple one. If a is bigger than four, then print some line of text. For example, a is bigger than four. And there we go. A is indeed bigger than four. And so this condition is going to evaluate it true. And then this block of code, which again is indented with two spaces to tell Python that all of this is related to this statement here, is going to run. Now, if I change the value of a to something like minus four, then that's not going to be true anymore because minus four is less than four. And so nothing is going to be printed. Uh, in fact, if you want to handle the case where the condition is not satisfied and you want to run some other code instead, then you could add an else statement. Uh, it's optional, but in this case, we can have it in order to handle the case where a is less or equal to four, in which case we can say that a is less than or equal to four. And now we are going to have a print. And in principle, you can add additional conditions. Uh, so for example, we could also handle the case where a is exactly equal to four. Right? We have three different options. So if a is larger than four, then print this. Uh, in order to have more than two different possibilities, we use the if statement, which allows you to type in any other condition, for example, a equals to four. And I'll talk in a second about why I'm using a double equality sign here. Uh, in that case, print a is equal to four. And then if none of those two hold, else, uh, so you, just, you should think about it as just literally talking to your computer in English. Like if a is bigger than four, do this. Uh, else, if a is equal to four, do this. And uh, if everything else fails, then do this. A is going to be less. Uh, it can't be equal anymore because then the second uh, condition will evaluate. Uh, and so now we have the situation where A is still less than four, but if I set it to four exactly, then the middle condition is going to run. And in this case, A is equal to four exactly. Uh, so the basic structure here is that we have a conditional statement here. And we'll look at some more complicated examples of this in a second. And that statement is followed by a block of code, which can have multiple lines if you like. All right, so you just add those spaces, and then this is how Python knows that this thing keeps on going. Right, so this line still refers to this condition here. So if I set it to five, then we're going to have two different lines printed. Uh, and you can have multiple of those. And this is basically everything there is to nonlinear flow. So the only thing that we need to talk about now is how exactly you structure those conditions. Uh, so we can start with very, very simple things. We could have two variables, for example, a equals four and then b equals five. And as we have already done, you can compare the two together. So you could ask Python, is a bigger than b? Uh, and that's not going to be true. That's going to be false. So this is something that we call a logical algebra or Boolean algebra. In fact, the result of this expression is also an item of data of this special type. If I force Python to display the type of this uh, expression, it's going to tell that it's a Boolean expression, which means they can be equal to either true or false. Uh, likewise, you have a less than sign. In this case, it's going to be true. You have less or equal to sign and larger or equal to sign. And you also have the not equal sign, which is an exclamation mark and an a equal sign. And what is very important, as you might have noticed here, is that if I'm comparing two different things, for example, a and four, or a and b, and I want to check if they are equal, so this is going to evaluate to false, I don't use one equal sign, I use two. 
And the reason why that is, is because we want to differentiate between the equality operator, which tests whether A is equal to B, and the assignment operator, which already uses a single character equal sign. And so those two statements mean very different things. So A equals B, one equal sign means assign A to B, means make A the same thing as B. But A double equals B is a question. We're not assigning B to A, we're asking, is A the same as B? And the answer is false. And if we set B to four, then the answer is going to be true. And so this is very important. This is one of the most common mistakes that people who start off with Python or in fact most languages make, is they confuse the two together. Unfortunately, in Python, it's really hard to do that without uh, triggering a fatal error. In many other languages, the code just runs and produces weird output. Uh, so fortunately, it's unlikely that that's going to happen. But if your conditions aren't running, then double check that you're using the correct equals sign. Now, if you have multiple conditional statements, multiple Boolean statements like this, you can combine them together with uh, operators, with logical operators that hopefully most of us are familiar with, and, or, and not. Right, so and evaluates to true whenever the two conditions that are being compared with it are both true. So for example, true and true is going to produce true. But if one of those is false, it's going to produce false. So again, I would think of it as speaking English. So a more complicated condition could be uh, A is bigger than three and B is less than six. All right, so that is true. And then this is true. And so the total should also be true. Or evaluates the true whenever one of those conditions is true. And the other one can be false, but at least one of them needs to be. So in this case, it's going to evaluate the true because both of those are true. I can make this one false, right? B is not equal to six, but it's still going to evaluate the true because this condition is true. But if both of them are false, uh, then it's going to evaluate to false. And finally, not is just inverting whatever the statement that follows after it is. So in this case, this is evaluating to false, but if I type not in front of all of it, and I will put it in parentheses to make sure that the order of operations is correct, it's just gonna take whatever is here, which used to be not, and it's gonna turn it into true. And you can use statement like this in your condition. So you could have an if statement around it, you need the colon at the end, so just the same way we did it out here, and you can make Python evaluate code whenever that is true. I am running. Okay, uh, so I know it might be a bit counterintuitive if you've never seen this before, but do we have any questions at this point about logical statements? Okay, so let's consider a slightly more difficult example, and I would like somebody to give me a prediction of what the output is going to be before running this code, and then maybe run this code and check it. Uh, so if we have not one equals two and one not equals three. Okay, so can somebody post in the chat what they expect the output of this is going to be? Just by looking at it. Okay, and yeah, that is indeed the case. So this is false, one is not equal to true. So let's just replace it like for convenience, right? So we know that's the case. Not false is gonna be true. One not equals three is true. So that's gonna be true. And then true and true is gonna be true, right? Because and returns true whenever both statements are true. And so the total is true. And this is exactly what we're getting. Okay. Uh, I'm glad that you guys are following or at least one of you. <laughs> Right. Uh, so this is one example of nonlinear flow when you have a condition. Another incredibly important example of nonlinear flow, which is implemented in any programming language, is a loop. Uh, so this is something that you want to keep doing over and over again until some condition is met. All right. So unlike a function, which is a bit of code that you have to call every single time, the loop just runs on its own until some condition is met that terminates it. And there are three main types of loops of which only two are implemented in Python. Uh, those are supposed to be while loop, for loop, and until loop, but there are no until loops in Python in case you're familiar with some other programming language where all three are implemented. 
And uh, we'll have a look at while loops first because they're a little bit simpler, although they're not as commonly used. So the idea behind a while loop is you just have the while keyword, and then you have some condition. For example, uh, let's create a new variable, let's call it i, and let's set it to zero. Uh, and uh, for example, let's say that that condition is going to be i less than 10. And now in the body of this loop, whatever is going to be happening here, uh, this body is going to be repeated by the interpreter over and over again, up to the point uh, that this condition no longer holds, right? So the moment that I becomes larger than 10 or equal to 10, this is gonna evaluate to false. And this is how the interpreter will know that it's time to stop. And inside of this, for example, we could print what the value of I is, just print it onto the screen. And we could also increase the value of i by one. Uh, and you can hopefully see what's going to happen, right? So i is going to start at zero, and it's going to print zero, and it's going to make i one, and it's going to do this again, and they're going to print one, and going to print two, print three. And eventually, i is going to be large enough that this condition is no longer going to be true, and then the loop is going to terminate. So hopefully, we're just going to get all the numbers from zero to nine up to the point that i becomes 10, and then the loop terminates. Now, if you accidentally <laughs> forgot about this line, then this condition is never going to be true. And this loop will just keep on running indefinitely. And it's just never going to stop. And then everything is going to hang. And you're going to get an enormous amount of output. And because we're running this on a Google server, I can actually do that. <laughs> so if I just run this, uh, then the cell is going to hang. And it's going to produce an enormous amount of output. And all of those are going to be zeros because i isn't changing. So what we can do is we can go to runtime and interrupt execution. And at this point, it is going to force stop the cell because it's never going to terminate. And now we have an enormous amount of output that we can scroll through. And all of those are zero. There's going to be like millions of those. Uh, this sort of tells you how fast computers are at doing these things. That's a little bit of a pain to scroll back up because I have to use two scrollers. OK. And the output was actually truncated to 5,000 lines. So it was significantly more than just 5,000 lines. Right, but with this line, this loop is eventually going to terminate, and we're only going to get numbers between 0 and 10. Uh, a few more important statements that you can use within loops are break and continue. If you run the break statement, then whenever the interpreter runs into this statement, it's just going to exit the loop. Uh, so just in case, let's uh, add some line of code at the very end outside of the loop, so I'm not indenting it anymore. And let's just uh, print out a string of text to tell us that the loop is done. Loop has finished so that we know when that happens. And without the break statement, if I comment it out, uh, the same thing that was happening before is going to happen, except we have this confirmation the loop has ended. But if I stick this break in, then the loop is only going to run once. And then it's going to run into this break statement, and it is going to terminate right away. And we can question. Yep. And when you run the loop before, it ran until i equals nine, but it didn't show i equals ten, uh, despite it was inside the loop. For example, he said like when i equals eight, it pre is i plus one, which is nine. Then i equals nine, which is less than ten, and then i equals ten. Ah, but it never printed before. Yeah, so uh, when it was 9, this evaluated a true. Mm -hmm. We entered an iteration of the loop. So it printed 9. Then i became 10. And I agree yeah. that the final value of i was 10. Uh, okay. But then the loop quit, and that never. In fact, we can test that, right? So if we just run it without the break, we get all the numbers from 0 to 9. But if we see the value of i, it's going to be 10. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was wondering about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're okay. right. i did become 10, but we never printed it. All right, so most commonly, I mean, why would you want a break statement that just breaks the loop on the first iteration? That doesn't make any sense, right? So most commonly, we'll be using it with a condition. For example, we could say something like, if i is equal to 5, then break. All right, and in this case, I'm using nested indentation because now I have the if statement inside the while statement. And now we expect that this loop is going to run up until the point that i equals 5, then it's going to break. And so we're only going to see all the numbers from 0 to 4. And uh, even though this condition will remain true, it doesn't matter because the break is going to break the loop. There is also uh, another statement called continue. And what that does is it 
stops the current iteration, but then it continues with the next iteration. It does not break the loop. It just goes on, it skips the iteration. So if you do it at the very end of the iteration, nothing is going to change because by the time the interpreter gets here, it's about to go back to the beginning anyway. But if we move this if statement to the beginning instead, and we place it out here, then what's going to happen is we're going to see all the numbers up to 10. Oh, no. OK, I need to interrupt that. Can you guys see what ha what's happening here? This is actually a very good example. <laughs> Uh, all right, so eventually we run into uh, this statement and then we continue on to the next iteration and I never increases, so I remains five forever. And so that remains true forever. So the loop got stuck again. So what I should have done is I should have put the increment before the if statement. So now hopefully it's going to run. Okay, this is what I intended to do. And now we have all the numbers from one until 10, except number five is missing. And that is because it never had a chance to print. Because this evaluated to true, and then the continue statement fired and took us back to the beginning of the loop. And by the way, this increment statement is incredibly common, where you just want to increase something by a certain amount. And there is a shortcut. So instead of typing all of that, you could just type plus equals. And this is going to be the exact same code. In fact, minus equals, multiply equals, all of those exist. Uh, let me just check the chat very quickly. Loop. Uh, okay. That was an answer to one of your previous questions. Right. Okay. Uh, so this is as far as while loops go, uh, and there's really not much to add about them. So if we have any questions, then uh, I'm going to keep on going to the for loops, which are far more common. Uh, but before we can get to for loops, we need to take a very short detour via iterable structures and lists, which is really the heart of Python. So, so far, we've dealt with a whole bunch of data types. We had integers, floats, complex numbers, functions, uh, and even Boolean statements. However, all of those store just one value. Well, I guess functions are weird, excluding functions. Uh, you can have one integer, you can have one real number in a float variable, you can have one string in a string variable. But as we mentioned in the beginning, we are dealing with an enormous amount of numbers. And you certainly don't want to be creating a billion variables and given all of those unique names, that's just going to take forever and that defies the purpose of programming. But we want data types that can store multiple values at the same time. And Python provides a whole bunch of those. And I just want to very briefly look at the most important ones. And perhaps the most important of all of those is a Python list. Uh, so let's create a list. I can give it a name. It's just a variable. So the standard rules hold. I'm going to call it my list. And the way you define lists in code is by using square brackets, or if you're American, just brackets. And you comma separate all the things that you want to be in that list. So we could have an integer, 11. We can have a string, hello. We could have a complex number. Uh, two minus six, James, just making it up as I go. Uh, you can even have another list within the list. And now if we run this, then this list is now saved in memory and we can print it back out and we can see what's inside and it just prints all those items back. You can access individual items by their index. So for example, if I want the first element of this list, I could just type brackets again uh, and put a zero inside. So the indexing starts with zero. So this is the zero element. This is the first element. This is the second element. And this will just give me 11. The first element is going to be hello. The second element is going to be my complex number, two minus six i. And then if I try to access an element that doesn't exist, for example, element number three, hopefully that's going to throw an error, which is going to say list index out of range. And it's right. This is exactly what is happening here. OK, so now we have this list of data. And let's say that we want our computer to do some kind of processing on that data. And in particular, we want uh, our computer to do whatever it is that we wanted to do on every single item of that list. And this is where for loops are coming in handy, because this is exactly what they're designed for. But before we go into for loops, let's see how hard it's going to be with a while loop. Uh, so let's 
creates a list that is made entirely out of integers. I just don't want uh, all this mixture of different data values. Let's just create a list of three integers. And let's say that my aim is to multiply all of those integers by a factor of two. Uh, so in fact, if I just try to take this list and multiply it by two like that, that's not going to work. Because when you do multiplication on the list, it is going to duplicate it. <laughs> so you just have, uh, we now just have 11, 34, 58, and then it repeats. In fact, if you add two lists together, you're going to concatenate. So I have only one list, but if I add it to itself, it's going to be the same thing. All right, so in order to be able to work on individual elements, we need to iterate over, we need a loop. So let's create a while loop. Uh, and let's keep track of which element we are working on right now. Uh, so the convention is to call that i. There is a reason why I was calling that variable i before. And let's start with the zero element. And on each iteration of the loop, we are going to increase i by one, right, the way we did it before. So we're going to start with a zero element. Then we're going to do the first element, the second element. We don't want this loop to overrun the list. So the condition is going to be while i is less than the length of the list. All right, so the moment i becomes equal to the length of the list, we want this loop to terminate. And we want this code to be universal. So we don't want it to work with just this particular list. We want it to work with any list of any length. And there is, in fact, a function called len in Python that is going to give you the total number of elements in the list. So if I run my len on my list, it's going to tell me that there are three elements in there. OK. And so I'm going to replace that three that we had before with the length of my list. And now this loop is doing what we wanted it to do. All right, so this value of i, let's print it out and see what it is on each iteration. All right, hopefully it's going to be one, two, and three. Uh, I guess we're iterating to, uh, we're in incrementing too early. So we want to do all the processing first. And so now we have zero, one, and two, and those will be the zero, the first, and the second element. And we can access those elements by using square bracket. Right? So we can take my list. Uh, and the ith element of that is just going to be the element that we're currently iterating over. And what we wanted to do, remember, is we wanted to multiply each element by a factor of two. So I'm just going to multiply that by a factor of two. And I'm going to save it back into that list. And now if I run this code, it's not going to print anything. But hopefully, my list is now a factor of two larger than it used to be. And you might have noticed that Python converted things into floats for us. Uh, and that's because I multiplied it by a float. If I multiplied it by an integer, it's going to remain an integer. But now it's going to be, well, if I rerun everything, it's going to be an integer. OK. Do we have any questions about this? Yes, I have a question. Actually, when I took the uh, MATLAB class last quarter, we used an operator which was dot and then the asterisk operator, which is served to multiply each element on the list. Does that oh. work in Python as well? We'll get to that in a moment. Yeah, it does not okay. work with native Python, but that's what NumPy, which is a library that we use, is for. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That is the reason why NumPy is so great, is because it allows you to do that. But if we're sticking to native Python, then you have to you have to go through pain. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is one way of doing it. Uh, but as it happens, there is a different type of loop in Python that actually does all of those things for you. And this is the for loop. So now what I would like to do is I would like to rewrite this while loop in terms of a for loop. And the for loop has the following syntax. So we start with for, then we, uh, give it a variable, and it does not have to be defined previously. It can just be any variable, even an undefined one. Python is going to define it for us. Uh, and let's call it element. And what's going to happen is this loop is going to go over every element in the list. And it's going to put the element that is currently being iterated over into this variable. And you'll see that in a second. And then we type in, which is another keyword. And then we give it the name of the list that we are going over. So this is going to be my list. And then there is a colon. And now within the body of this loop, again, indented with two spaces, the element that we're going 
over at the moment is going to be saved in the element variable. So if I just print it, it's going to give me all the elements of that list. So you can see that this structure is far easier than this structure. Right? So the for loop is specifically designed to go over lists and not just lists in general, but any so-called iterable structure. And list is the flagship example of an iterable structure in Python. We'll have a look at a few more in just a second. Now you can't edit the elements like this. So if I do uh, the obvious thing, and if I just try to multiply this element by a factor of two, that's not going to work. Because if I type this list back, uh, if I type my list back, if I display my list back at me, then it wouldn't have changed. And that is because this is a brand new variable. So the Python is going to copy the value over into this variable. But by editing this variable, we're not going to edit the original list. So in order to be able to edit the original list, we also need to know the index of the elements and so not just the element itself, but we want to know if it's the zeroth element or the first element or the second element and the like. And there is a special function in Python called enumerate. And if I add a call to that function here and wrap my list into it, so what this function is going to do is it's going to return a special structure that has not just the elements of the list, but also the indices. And I can add the index here as an extra uh, iterant variable. And if it doesn't make sense, it will in a second. So now if I print what I have, I still have my element as I'm going through the list. So I have 11, 34, and 58, but I also have the indices, 0, 1, and 2. And I can print them both at, both at the same time if you like. And now I can actually do the editing. So I can't change the element, but what I can do is I can just change the value by that index directly. And this is going to be the exact same statement that we had before. So I'm just going to take the i element. And hopefully, if we run this uh, and display the list again, it is going to increase by a factor of two, which was the original goal. And so this is pretty much the most common for loop structure that you encounter. You have uh, the index, the variable that is being iterated over, and uh, you use this enumerate function in order to turn this list into a structure that can give both. OK, do we have any questions about this? No questions in the chat yet. No questions, or there are questions? There are no questions yet. OK, fantastic. No. But I think there's a verbal question. Carlos. Yes. Oh, Carlos and Adrian. So Carlos, do you want to go first and Adriana next? Uh, okay. Uh, I guess Adriana, you want to go first and then Carlos can go second? Right. Well, uh, I, can follow, I can follow you at the end for the loops, but I get, I have a, I have some errors when I am look, I am trying your exercise. So uh, I have one question. I have two points. I mean, the end of the, the while and the if, a sentence we use two dots. Mm. Oh, the, the colon, yes, two points. Colon, yes, sorry, columns. Um, I am not pretty sure when it's going to be used only for those sentences. Also, we have for if oh, for loops, print doesn't have, um, well, right so print is a function so it's just uh the same kind of object that the functions that we define for uh, finding the roots of a quadratic equation and the like right so it's just it's basically a variable it has a name and then it has arguments so we put them in parentheses and what it does is it just takes the arguments and it prints them okay uh, and for while and def are statements and they have unique syntax that is specific to that statement. And as it just so happens that all of those statements do require a colon at the end, which okay. tells Python that, yeah, this is the end uh, of, of this part of this structure. Right, right. Well, um, I guess I'm going to follow the, the session recorded because I, I couldn't have the right results for the loops, but I am, I keep working. Thank you. 
Do you mind pasting your code in the chat and I could maybe very quickly have a look at it? Oh, uh, okay, okay, I can. Actually, Roman, why don't I take a look at it and you can keep okay. it. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, it, am I allowed to, to Totally. Uh, well, why don't you, Adrian, just so that Roman can continue on, why don't you paste the, Yes, yes, at the end. Yeah, I paste it wait. into the chat. Yes. Well, you can paste it in the chat and I can, I can work with you offline. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we've dealt with lists and this can is- Can you explain again what enumerate does? And like why we have I comma element. Can you explain again what that? Right, yeah. So you don't need to, to have that in general, right? So the most basic structure of a for loop is what we had before, right? In my list uh, and then something. So here's what it's doing, right? So there's my list, which is a list. It has three values in it. It has the values of 22, 68, and 160. All right, so what this statement means is run a loop and iterate over every element of my list. So this loop is going to run three times. It's going to run once for this element, once for this element, and once for this element. And on each iteration, the value of the element being iterated is going to be put in the element variable. So if I print it, I'm just going to say three different print statements, one, two, and three, that are the values of that list. Right, what, what I can't do is I can't edit this list because this element is actually a copy. So if I edit this element, if I set it to something like, uh, I don't know, itself times two, right, which is what I was trying to times five, whatever, then it's not going to change anything. Even though the element is going to increase by a factor of five, the list itself is going to stay the same because the element is no longer connected to that list. It's a copy. So what I need to know is I need to know the index. I need to know when I'm iterating over the element, whether it's the zeroth element or the first element or the second. And this is where we get to this structure here. Right? so if I add enumerate here and an I at the beginning, then uh, element is still going to be the same, but I is going to tell me what the sequential number of that element is, whether it's the zero element or the first or the second. And now I can edit it. Is that okay? Okay, yes. Yeah, so basically it, it it changes the the list itself, like it edits it without you having to create a new list and appending each new element, right? Yeah, well, yeah. In general, it gives me the values of both the index and the element. And in this case, I am editing it, but you could be doing something else. Uh, you could be, uh, I don't know, you could be using that in some other calculation that requires both the index and the uh, and the value. But yeah, that is that is the, the purpose why we're doing it here. OK, uh, so we dealt with lists. Uh, and I want to very, very briefly mention a few more iterable structures, iterable types that we have in Python. And I guess a somewhat important one that I see every now and then is a set. And you can take a list. So let's create a new list, for example, I don't know, two, three, four, five, 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 and I'm doing this deliberately and you'll see in a second why. And I can type cast this list into a set. And what's going to happen is that a set is very similar to a list, except it's not allowed to have duplicating values. Uh, so if I do this type casting, then all of those fives are gonna disappear and there's only going to be one in here. And this is because I type cast it into a set and a set is basically the same thing as a list, except it can't have duplicates. Uh, another important iterable structure is a dictionary. And this is something that Adam asked me to talk about. And this is very similar to a list, except instead of numeric indices, the element of a dictionary have names. And I'm going to, I guess, demonstrate this with a simple example. So let's say that we have a star. Uh, this is just the name of the variable. And what I can do is I can turn it into a dictionary. And the way you do it is by adding curly braces. And then this star can have multiple elements. And instead of numbers, those elements are going to have names. For example, the star could have right ascension, and it could be equal to 30.5. And it could have a declination, and that could be equal to minus 5.6. And it could have a name, and that could be vega. So this creates a star. So notice that what I'm doing, everything is in curly braces. And then I just go over uh, index 
value pairs separated by colon, and uh, the pairs are separated from each other with a comma. So I can run this. So now the star is in the memory. And if I print it out, uh, it is going to give me all those values back. If I ask Python what the type of that structure is, it's going to tell me that it is a dictionary. And I can access individual elements the way I did it with lists, except not with a number, but with the names of those elements. So I can ask what the array of that star is. And it's going to tell me 30.5, or what's the name of that star is. Uh, and this is something that you see quite commonly. It allows for much neater organization. Right? So if I just created a list to store the parameters of my star and just shoved everything in, uh, it would be really hard to tell things apart. You would have to like, provide documentation. Okay, the zeroth element in this list is right ascension, and the first one is declination. But with a dictionary, you don't have to do this because the dictionary is documenting itself. So this is something that is incredibly common. And otherwise, dictionaries behave in pretty much the same way as lists. In fact, we can go back and we can iterate over a dictionary. Uh, so let's try a very simple for loop for element in star and print the element. Except when you're iterating over a dictionary, the element is going to be the index. So instead of printing 30.5 minus 2.6 on Vega, it's actually going to print right ascension, declination, and name. And if you want to access the value, then you would have to access through the dictionary directly. Uh, and another important difference is that dictionaries are unordered. So that means that this order is completely arbitrary. And if I ran this on a different computer or even uh, in a different session, this order might change. So you should not write your code in a way that's reliant on the order. Uh, there is a package called collections, which you can import. And we're probably not going to have enough time to talk about it. That has a special type called audit dictionary. Uh, but the default Python dictionary is on audit. OK. Do we have questions about dictionaries or sets or lists? So I'm about to jump into the most important iterable structure in the entirety of Python. OK. So now we had a question about uh, multiplying things by two directly or using the dot product and the like. Uh, so this is where we're coming to the, the climax of this lecture, I suppose. Uh, Python isn't powerful because it's super powerful by default. Python is incredibly powerful and so widely used because of the packages that come with it. And so there are uh, third party packages that are so incredibly universal and versatile. Uh, which is why we're all using this programming language in the first place, because those packages exist and they are written in that programming language. And the most important of those packages is the so-called numerical Python package, or NumPy. Or some people pronounce it NumPy, uh, which is really strange, but there is no official pronunciation somehow. And this is what I would like to conclude this lecture with. Right, so, so far, we've only been using native tools everything that comes with Python every time you load a session. So now I'm going to delete everything that is here. Uh, can I use Control A? Let's see. No, I cannot. OK, so I'll just delete them one. So go up into the, um, I think, either file or edit, and there's a way to select all cells. Oh, there is. Oh, select all cells. OK, fantastic. Does delete work, or do I have to? Give it a try. OK, fantastic. Thank you. That worked. OK, so if we are going to use a third party package, the first thing that we need to do is we need to import it. And there is a statement. And it's an example of a statement that does not require a colon. <laughs> uh, so we just type import uh, and then the name of the package. And hypothetically, this is the minimalistic import statement. And it is going to work. Uh, but very often, packages come with lengthy names. Well, NumPy is an example of one of those. But uh, sometimes you want to give that package an alias to refer to. And so most commonly, you don't actually see NumPy being imported like that. And instead, you see a slightly longer version of this statement, import NumPy SNP. So this is just a standard convention. So what I'm telling Python to do here is to import NumPy. And I would like to be able to call that package SNP. This is the alias. And NP is, in fact, now also a variable. And that variable is an object, and it has attributes. And those attributes is what we are going to use. So remember how imaginary numbers, 1 plus 2j, they had attribute called real. Uh, 
right? And that will give us the real part of that number. So in the same way, this package, NumPy, which now goes by the alias MP, for example, it has a attribute called pi, and that gives us the circle constant. It has an attribute called E that gives us the Euler's constant. Attributes can also be functions that you can call. Nice. And in that case, we would call them a method. Uh, for example, there is a method called sign. And now this is just a regular function. So you can uh, open brackets and it will automatically display documentation. And we could, for example, calculate this sign of pi radians. And that's going to happen. It's something like minus 0.96. And there is also a cosine function. There are functions for solving differential equations. There are functions for solving regular equations. There are functions for doing integrations. There are functions for doing linear algebra. This package is just so incredibly versatile and it does so many things. And this is just one of many. Uh, later this week, we'll talk about SciPy and AstroPy and the like. But for now, let's focus on this. Uh, this package also comes with new data types. And the most important one of those is the so-called NumPy array. And first of all, before we go to NumPy arrays, let's talk a little bit more about lists. Let's create another list. And let's fill it up with numbers. Two, four, seven, just making things up. Doesn't really matter. Uh, so previously, in order to multiply every element by two, what we had to do is we had to iterate over every individual element and literally multiply it by two. And if we just multiply this list by two, that's not going to work uh, because this is going to duplicate it. That's how lists work. Uh, and this is where NumPy arrays are coming in. So they are a special iterable type that is vectorized. And what that word means that whenever you carry out a mathematical operation on that variable, it will be automatically applied to every element within it. Uh, so let's typecast my list into an array. Uh, so remember that the way we typecast is we just uh, yeah, we just call the uh, the function that corresponds to the name and my list, except this is not going to work because the array function is not a native Python feature. It lives inside this NP library. So we have to add NP. This is just going to be an attribute. And now the result of this is going to be a NumPy array. It doesn't look any different so far, but let's save it in some variable. Let's call it my array. And let's try multiplying it by two now. And now duplication is not happening anymore. Instead, this operation has been propagated. And we are getting a new array that is uh, that has every element increased by a factor of two. So this operation automatically got distributed across this entire array. Uh, you can also combine multiple arrays together. So let's create another array. Uh, for example, my list two. You can also have digits in your variable names. And let's fill it up with a different set of numbers. And what we can do now is we can typecast them both into arrays. I'm just going to copy that and paste that. And let's call that my array two. So now both of them are arrays. And now you can multiply one array by the other. If you try to do this with lists, you would get an error because Python can't multiply lists. Uh, but if you're multiplying two arrays, then all that's going to happen is that every element of this list, or rather, every element of this array is going to be multiplied by every element of the other array. Uh, do we have any questions about this? Just, I appreciate that for somebody uh, with no vectorization background like myself, when I first started doing Python, moving on from uh, Pascal, this was super alien. I was thinking, like, how does it know what to do? <laughs> OK, so let's consider a slightly more complicated example. Uh, so what I would like to do now is I would like to use this feature in order to do an integral. And there is a function inside NumPy that can do integrals for you, but that's boring. Let's write our own integration routine. So let's say, let's add a text here. Let's try and integrate, uh, for example, uh, from 0 to pi uh, sine of x. Right, so let's try and calculate that numerically. So we just want to get the best approximation. Can, can, can somebody give me the analytic solution first? <laughs> OK. 
in the chat. Okay, no exploit in calculus, but I think that is equal to two. <laughs> right, because that's going to be uh, at minus cos. Right. Okay, let's let's figure it out. Uh, so you, what we need to do is first of all we need to give Python this function, right? We need to record this function in uh, Python variables. And whenever you do numerical stuff, functions are not mathematical functions. They're not what you think they are. Instead, they are just tables of numbers. And so we're just going to have a table with lots of x's and table with lots of y's. And we're going to sample this function at some really, really high frequency. And then we're going to hope that that frequency is enough in order for us to get an accurate estimate. Uh, so first of all, let us uh, get an x-axis. So I want to integrate this function from 0 to pi. And so what I want to do is I want a regular grid of numbers from 0 to pi. I want lots of those numbers. For example, I don't know, 10,000. And there is a function within NumPy called linspace. And notice that because it's within NumPy, I have to add this np dot because it's an attribute, uh, or more technically, a method of the np variable, np object. And it accepts three different arguments. And if you can't remember what these arguments are, then this is what the doc strings are for. Hopefully, it's going to tell us if I open the brackets. No? OK, there we go. So the first argument is start, which is where the grid starts. And then the second argument is stop, which is where the grid stops. And then num is the number of points. So let's go from 0 to uh, pi, which I could just type in by hand, but I don't have to do it because it's actually an attribute of numpy. And let's have 10,000 points. All right, so if I print this variable now, I'm just going to have a massive array. And it's not showing us all of it. Uh, this ellipsis is here. But those are just regularly spaced numbers between 0 and pi. Great. So now we need the y coordinate here. And we can use np dot sign to calculate the sign and remember vectorization, right? So if I apply operation to the array to x, it's going to automatically propagate it and take a sign of every single value within that array. So now if I print y, it's just going to give me the signs of all of those numbers. Uh, and now we can just use the trapezium rule, uh, right? So we were going to need dx. So that would be the difference. Uh, and what I would like to do now is I would like to take the very last element, and I would like to subtract it from the element before it. And then I would like to take that element and subtract it from the element before it. So I would need the small differences between all of those points. And in order to do that, uh, we need to resort to another quite an interesting and fairly unique feature of Python. Uh, well, I guess it's, it's only unique if you're not accounting for all the other uh, languages that evolved from Fortran, such as MATLAB and the like, uh, is array slicing. Uh, so remember that if we have a structure such as a list or an array, we can reference an individual element with its index. So for example, if I want the 100th value in the x array, then I can just evaluate this, and it's going to give me the 100th value. But what you can also do is you can ask for a range of values. And this is something that we call array slicing. And you do it with a colon. This is a different use of a colon in Python. And you specify the beginning and the end of the range. So for example, if I type this out, then I am asking for all the elements starting with the 100th element and until the 150th element. So this is going to produce 150 elements. Sorry, not 150 elements, right? From 100 to 150, we can check. Uh, and I think it's going to be 49 rather than 50. Oh, no, it is 50. OK, so it is including 100, but not including 150, which is 50 numbers. Ah, off by one error. All right. The point is that we have all those numbers from 100 to 150. And in principle, you could also omit one of those numbers. And in this case, you're going to be going all the way to the end or all the way to the beginning. So this statement here would uh, give us all the numbers starting with 100 number and going up to the end of the list. Uh, so they don't fit on the screen, which is why the ellipsis is here. But hopefully, uh, the length of this structure is going to be the total length, which is 10,000 minus the 100 that we trimmed uh, in the beginning. Right? So that's 9,900. Uh, alternatively, you can only specify the second number in the range and not the first one. 
And in this case, you're going to get all the elements starting with the zero and up until that one. So this gives us all the elements starting with the zeroth element, so the very beginning of that list, and up until the 500th element, or rather 499th element, because it's not included. And you can also count from the back. All right, so if you type something like that instead, to just a negative index instead of a positive index, what that means is you want to start from the beginning, because there's no first number, and you want to keep on going until 100th element counting from the end. OK, so I know this is not terribly intuitive. So do we have any questions about this? The slicing? OK, and there's, there's far more advanced slicing that you can do. And I think I will post a Jupyter notebook about it. But this is everything that we need to know in order to be able to complete this. I'm just going to delete the cell because this was an example. All right, so what I want to do is I want to take the last element and subtract the element before it from it. Then we'll take the element before that and subtract the element before it and the like. And the way to do it is by taking my x. And I want all the elements except for the first one. And subtract all the elements in x except for the last one. All right, so this is starting with 1. Uh, and because remember that we count from 0, so this is uh, everything except the first element up to the end. And this is all the elements from the beginning up to the last one and not including it. And so this is going to give me the differences between all the adjacent x values. So if I run this cell and then I look at my dx, so those are just going to be small differences. And they're all constant. And this is what we expect because this function produces a regularly spaced grid. And it looks like pi. And that makes sense because that regularly spaced grid has 10,000 points from 0 to pi. And finally, we can just compute the integral. Uh, right? So we can multiply those dx's by y's, which is going to be the area of all of those tiny elements of the Riemann sum. Uh, and this is going to produce an error. And can somebody tell me why? Actually, this is a, this is a good exercise, I guess. So if I just run this and I call this uh, areas, this is not going to run. Okay, does that error help? They have to be the same shape? The yeah, same that's right. Yeah, so uh, the dimension of x is 10,000, the dimension of y is the same, but the dimension of this is 9,999. The dimension of this is 9,999. And when we subtract one from the other, uh, we get a total dimension of 9,999 and dx. And you can't multiply something that has 9,999 elements by something that has 10,000. So the vectorization doesn't work. And you can't multiply two different vectors that come from completely different vector spaces. Uh, and that makes sense, right? Because the number of gaps between numbers in a regularly spaced grid is one uh, fewer than the total number of numbers. And there are fancier solutions to this, but like the easiest way out, because we are considering really small elements and like a small error is not really going to matter, is just not to consider all of the elements of Y uh, and only go up to the last one. So now this is going to run. And finally, we want to add all of those areas up of our Riemann sum to get the final integral. So the result is going to be, there is actually a function that does that, that takes any uh, iterable and sums up all the numbers within it. So if we sum all of those areas and we print the result, and we pray to God, uh, that's going to be 2. There we go. This is a numerical integral, uh, and we got the value of 2. And we could have done it significantly faster. We could have just disregarded all of this stuff, uh, because there is actually a function within NumPy that does that for us. And it's called MP traps for the trapezoid rule. Uh, and the result would be just, it accepts two arguments. The first one is y and the second one is x. And it's going to give us the same result. OK, so this is vectorization in practice and NumPy arrays specifically. Uh, it might. I actually don't think that is the case uh, because uh, all of those are going to be in SciPy, which is a different module. 
Uh, Adam, are you aware of any other functions in NumPy? Yeah, sorry, I think you're right. I think the other ones are in SciPy. TrapC is the, uh, the, the NumPy version. But even with SciPy, I, I usually just use TrapC. It's pretty good. OK. Uh, so I think this would be a reasonably good point for me to stop, because we are running out of time. So if we go very briefly back to my slides, uh, then what does it mean to be weakly typed? Uh, so remember that Python was automatically converting things for us. So if I could give the very last example, so if you imagine this condition here, uh, if true, print, hello. All right, so this makes sense because you have a Boolean statement here and it's going to evaluate it true. And so this is going to run. However, if I placed a number here instead, uh, it's still going to run. But like, why is 12 true? Uh, this is because Python is going to automatically typecast data to the appropriate data type. Uh, using some really weird rules that are sometimes referred as type juggling. And we also saw that with integers. When I couldn't divide integers, it made them floats automatically. And this is something that modern programming languages tend to do. And this is something that older languages such as C++ and Fortran, the strongly typed languages, did not do. And people who are used to those probably think of this as complete madness, as you lost control of everything. But this is how we code these days. So this is what it means to be weakly typed. And now we've deciphered the entirety of this line. So Python is a high level interpretate weakly typed programming language. Uh, and finally, this is the GitHub that we created for uh, the Inlace, Inlace, how do you pronounce that, program. Uh, and right now, I think the only thing that's in here is uh, Christian's matplotlib to, oh, that's the wrong thing. I'm going to, well, this is the right link, but uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the wrong URL. Uh, but this is the link. I'm going to post it in the chat in a second. Uh, and I am going to upload the notes as well as uh, a bunch of notebooks covering those further topics uh, by the end of today. Uh, and I think I'm going to stop right here and take any questions. And I'll just add in, I'm going to add in another uh, um, uh, Jupyter Notebook that you can play with as well um, that has a lot more kind of basic commands. We didn't think that was useful at the time, um, but that will be a little bit more practice if you if you just need more basic practice on the, the core Python uh, structures. Okay, looks like everything was clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, question in the chat, maybe. Oh, thanks, Carlos. That would also be helpful to, to share as well. If you could send me, maybe you can send me a, an email with those. I can post them in the same place. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for sitting through two hours of this boring introduction to Python. Way to sell it. <laughs> uh, well, yes, thanks everyone. So uh, you will get lots of practice, so don't worry. We're gonna actually, most of our workshops this week are gonna be using Jupyter Notebooks to go through some uh, explorations of some of the packages that Roman mentioned, including our next one, which is at four o'clock. So we're gonna take an hour break here and then uh, we'll be back. Uh, Christian Aganze will be leading a, a presentation on that Plotlib. And then I will be doing, which is a plotting package, and then I'll be doing uh, as much as we can in the remaining time on a pandas package, which is uh, working with databases. Um, all right, so see everyone at four o'clock. And as you explore these things and have questions, remember that we also have office hours. Dino will have his first office hours at six o'clock tonight if you uh, want to ask some questions then a little bit more on one on one. All right, see everyone in an hour. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.